Perfect. Um, okay, so we are here. This is a, a video series that we are doing for our appeal entitled For the Planet for You. Um, so now through December 31st, we have a goal to raise $5,000. Um, and this contribution helps strengthen uh, Bernheim's effort in conservation, uh, sustainability, nature-based education, and so much more. Um, I, as of this morning, we are at $42,770, which is amazing. So thank you to all who have helped donate. Uh, again, if you're interested in doing so, you can check the link on this um, slide right here that will take you there. Um, I do just want to say again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a conversation with phenomenal Bluegrass Botanical uh, creator and 2020 artist in residence, Gabriella Boros. Um, I do want to plug next week's uh, For the Planet For You uh, virtual session. Uh, this is a Save Bernheim update and discussion. Uh, this will be next Thursday from 12 to 1 p.m. And it will be presented by Dr. Mark Worms, our executive director, and Andrew Berry, our director at Cons of conservation. So again, this information, the link to register can all be found um, at the link you see on the screen here. Uh, I think we have some people in the room that haven't been here. So I just kind of want to give a brief overview of, of Bernheim and, and what we do. Uh, you know, Bernheim is a nonprofit educational and recreational nature preserve. Uh, we're located 25 miles south of Louisville in Claremont, Kentucky. Gosh, we have over 16,000 acres. We are the largest area of private protected land east of the Mississippi River. We're home to over 900 species of plants. We have a nationally recognized 600 acre arboretum. Uh, we have large expanses of scenic woodlands and you know, more than 40 miles of hiking trails. And Bernheim is a place of artistic inspiration for artists from the round, around the world. Uh, our mission is connecting people to nature, and we have been doing this since 1929. And we do this through a variety of lenses, uh, the first of which is nature-based education. Uh, we do this through regenerative design and sustainable landscapes. Uh, we connect people to nature through research and land stewardship. Uh, we also do this through play and our Children of Play Network. And we do this through arts. <clears throat> so Bernheim connects people to nature through the lens of art. Art is a core value at Bernheim. Um, art engages people in ways that are different from science and education. And art distinguishes us from organizations that are similar to us. Uh, there are four distinct yet overlapping components within the arts and nature department the crux of which is our um, artist in residence program currently celebrating its 40th anniversary in 2020. And this is an annually award opportunity that invites artists to live at Bernheim and make site specific work uh, based on their uh, total immersion experience with the natural environment. Uh, this is an internationally renowned residency. We've had artists from over 10 countries visit Bernheim throughout the decades. And one of the great things about this program is that an artist will gift back a work of art to be installed either on our grounds or within our facilities. And uh, these are works that engage our visitors in new and exciting ways. Uh, before I get into tonight's special guest, I just kind of want to highlight a few other great projects from our 40th anniversary year. Uh, the first is by artist Lee Running from Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, she is a sculptor and an installation artist. And she completed a beautiful, colorful, transparent window installation inside our um, Sassafras room of the visitor center. And she was inspired by the American sycamore tree. So as you can see here, uh, her inspiration came from budding sycamore leaves that she then 
traced under projection and then uh, manipulated in uh, digitally to print the vinyl adhesives that uh, you can see here on the windows. Um, I'm purposely only giving you a hint of this because I encourage you to come to Bernheim and see it in person for yourself. Um, this is a living installation, I like to say. It, it will change by the day, by the season, literally by the hour. And you can see some of the light and the reflections that are taking place on, on the wall behind it. It's also really cool from the exterior. There's uh, this sense that the installation has always been there. It truly seamlessly blends into the landscape. Lee paired this with another installation, which is uh, inside a hollow sycamore tree on our Imlik Trail. Uh, and the little honeycombed pattern that you can see behind Lee on the right-hand side is really that um, honeycombed, um, honeycombed pattern that's in the seeds that fall from the sycamore tree. So uh, the Emlick Trail is an adventurous and challenging trail, but it's definitely worth the visit to see this in person. We also invited Luz Lucy Azubike uh, from Frankfort, Kentucky to uh, come and stay with us this, this past year. And um, Lucy is a sculptor who is observing nature as the sculptor. Um, she is recognizing natural shapes and forms and, um, excuse me, she's, uh, she's recognizing these natural shapes and forms as whole and complete works of art. And uh, we've helped Lucy launch a campaign uh, that invites the public to share their tree art findings as well, whether it be at Bernheim or in their backyard, uh, and upload these images with the hashtag One Million Tree Arts on Instagram or Facebook. So here we are to, uh, with our special guest tonight. I'm so excited to introduce you to Gabriella Boros. Um, born to Holocaust survivors, drawer, printmaker, photographer, Gabriella Boros immigrated to the United States as a young child. Um, her love for the narrative was derived from the rich heritage of her European parentage, her Israeli childhood, and American influences. Uh, her woodblock prints almost always created in a series range in topics from personal and feminist fables uh, to spiritual topics and scientific political works. Uh, they exhibit humor and editorial commentary, but most of all, wonderful pattern and line. Um, the truths that Gabriella narrates are very personal, but the resulting images have a universal appeal. Um, she graduated with a BFA from the University of Michigan School of Art and is currently living and working in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, we will be pr premiering a video that we have not shown yet to the public this evening that gives you an overview of Phenomenal Bluegrass Botanicals, which is the series of woodblock prints that Gabriella created honoring um, 10 historically significant Kentucky women through the invocation of 10 Kentucky native plants. Um, after Gabriella um, did so much research and sketched and carved from wood blocks and printed these images, we took it a step further and um, printed these images onto fabric banners, which hang on trees around our Lake Nevin Loop. Uh, and Gabriella will be speaking more about her process once I hand it over to her shortly. But in the meantime, we will start here. Hello, my name is Gabriella Boros. I am an artist um, working in the Chicago area. And I started as a painter in many years ago. And when I went to a family trip to Florence nine years ago, I saw woodcuts 
that were so amazing and so remarkable that I suddenly changed my entire art practice from painting <laughs> to doing woodblock prints. I found that I love nature and I love trees and I love wood. And here I was able to create art from the wood, which was so fun for me. This particular project that I have brought to Kentucky is something remarkable. It's really different. What I wanted to do was join women, great women of Kentucky, and nature, the great nature of Kentucky. And I wanted to join it and be able to hang it in a place that is a love of nature kind of place. This year is the year for the suffragette movement. This year is the year for Bernheim's 40th. And so we brought everything together with these set of 10 banners. The women that I chose were women that in some way changed Kentucky history. I wanted to show women that might be underrepresented and I really was excited about emphasizing the uniqueness of the women with the plants that I brought in. I did the research about these women and then I found plants with the help of the horticulturists here at Bernheim. We found plants that were significant to the forest, significant to Kentucky and all native to this area. So for example, for Florence, our plant is called the hepatica plant and hepatica is of the liver because the leaves of the hepatic plant look like a liver lobe. She was a doctor, so she gets a liver lobe plant. So these women, the more I read about them and kind of when you're, when you're carving with these metal tools on the board, it's almost like you're stroking somebody's face. You're bringing out their features from a piece of wood and you feel an intimacy. You feel a closeness to people. And each banner you will see has um, kind of vignettes that I found were important elements to these women's life. I got so close to these women. It was a pleasure. Sorry, it's not wanting to advance for me. Um, I just wanted to say before I handed this over to Gabriella that um, we were really fortunate enough to uh, have been awarded an Art Mies Activism Grant from the Kentucky Foundation of Women. And uh, this grant has enabled us to create a traveling companion exhibition uh, where we'll be able to share this work uh, in locations throughout the state. Uh, our first, first location will be in downtown Louisville and we'll be making that announcement of where that location is in just a few short weeks. Um, but thank you so much for being here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it over to Gabriella. Thank you, Jenny. And I just wanna thank all of the people that are joining us today. There are people here from Australia, from Hawaii, and it's just really so remarkable for me to have such a wonderful community when we're all so isolated. Thank you. I wanted to talk a little bit about the launch of this project, how we chose these women. I had initially found a list um, the, on the Kentucky government website of women and I went through and I did some research about the women that seemed so interesting, um, then did even more research to find different women that weren't on that list. And we came up with 10 women. One of the women I really wanted to acknowledge was Amanda Bernheim, who I think taught Isaac Bernheim, the founder of the Bernheim Forest, his love of the forest, his love of nature. She would go out and take long walks with him when they were first dating, and they continued to do that throughout their life. 
And I think that without that kind of bonding with nature, he wouldn't have come up with this idea of taking land that had been strip mined for ore and turning it into this charming, gorgeous, beautiful, verdant place where people can connect to nature so close to Louisville. I am, um, so that was, that was initially uh, where we started and of course went into great detail with the research. I pulled down all kinds of information about the women, including things like what kind of what kind of plane did she fly, Willa Brown fly, when she was in, in the Air Force? And so all these kinds of details were so relevant to the final product. I now have a little video that I produced or that, that Jenny helped produce about my process from beginning to end. And if Jenny, if you could start. No sound. No sound. Jenny, can you try and are you on mute? You may be able to unmute yourself and maybe that will help. Oh, okay. Thank you, Amy. Okay, it's rolling now. Apologies. Today I'm working on a panel for a wonderful musician named Jean Ritchie. And so my first step was to download some materials off the internet about who she was. I listened to a lot of her music um, and I found that her voice was just absolutely beautiful. And she also wrote and composed her own music. Is the drawing that I will use as the basis for the woodblock print. And um, I do approximately five to six of these drawings. Each one took, takes about an hour and a half or two hours to do. Um, at the very top right, there's the cuckoo. Um, wrote a lot about um, farmers. Um, you have the pawpaw fruit and the pawpaw flower and leaves because that was the plant that I chose for her, something that was very fruitful and sweet. And here we have Jean herself and she played the mountain dulcimer and I have her instrument next to her. Um, so what I do is I take um, a, a piece of Sheena plywood and this is uh, 3 8 inch wide plywood. It has um, paneling on both sides, so I can cut both sides of one sheet. So it's very economical. It's made in Japan from basswood. And um, what I do is I ink up the Sheena so that I have both um, moisturizing the wood and making it more pliable to cut. And also it makes it easy for me to see what I'm cutting and to see the image as I'm cutting it. Who is I trace, I use uh, tracing paper underneath here and I trace this image onto the wood. And you can see the blue lines are my indication as to where I'm going to be cutting. And then um, I use my cutting tools. Um, for this project, since there are large areas where I'm clearing out the wood, I actually bought a new knife that, uh, that accompanies this family of knives that I have. This is my favorite tool. It's a, these are all you gouges. Very thin line is a 1.5 millimeter tool. All these knives are made in Japan. I bought a new tool for this project because although I do sharpen my tools, they never ever are the same 
after I sharpen them. And with this tool, the gouge, I can then create these really fine lines that you see in here that are, um, they give you the texture, they give you the feeling of the folds of the cloth. And um, also I can, I can clear with a big tool, but when I need to get close to a very sensitive area, I need the smaller tool. The reason I make masks is because woodblock is a surface that has a lot of ridges after it's cut. And so in order to prevent some of that noise, I print up uh, all of my prints with masks. So what I do is I take this material, which is called Duralar. It's a quite a, a thin um, acetate and I put it right down on the surface that's already been cut. And then I go around my edges and um, I cut the mask. My intention is for the white areas to stay as white as possible. So after I've cut all the masks, and you can see that I actually have 11 masks on this particular print, um, I, my next step is to squeeze out the ink and I use this wonderful Canfield Calibo ink. Um, and it's non-toxic. And then what happens is that it kind of conditions the ink. It makes it easier to work with. After um, I condition it for a little bit, pick out my brayer, which is also, so this is a Japanese brayer. And again, I'm still trying to condition the the ink and make it, um, it's a liquid, but it's kind of solid when you first start working with it. Again, I try to condition it. Um, there's a certain consistency that I'm looking for over the ink surface. And the next thing that I do is I'm going to um, I'm going to remove all of the masks and I do it in order because there's so many, I don't want to forget a mask. Um, so that's, uh, they're numbered and I put them in order on the, on this kind of holder is I, I ink. And so, uh, on the surface. So I like to go vertically and horizontally. Um, as I said, this is kind of like a solid and a liquid. And so it's good to go both ways. Um, it gives a nice, richer, dark black. Um, this way. And all the way down. Next, I'm going to put on the masks in order. So, um, it's always tricky to remember which masks go where, especially in the first couple prints. Um, even when you, even when you number them. And you can see why I want to mask it because there's just so much noise here. I really don't want that noise there. It's not going to compositionally help anything. Um, it's very difficult to just keep uh, getting it down to the wood. So it's just easier to use a mask. And um, that way I get a nice clean white, no noise.
put the board on the jig. And the jig is a, an outline of the piece of paper that I'm rolling out. And it is the, um, it actually shows me exactly where to put the board. It's three in the right spot. <laughs> and this way it's nice and straight. It's centered. It's exactly where I want it to be. So this is my proof stage. That means that I'm just trying to make sure that everything is exactly the way I want it to be. Um, this is a piece of paper that I've obviously messed up. So that's gonna be what I'm using for my proof. Um, and because the paper is so long and big, it's much easier to kind of unroll it onto the surface. Um, so I use this kind of tube and I, this is the printing surface. So this surface is much smoother. This is much rougher. The paper is called Okawara. It's a Japanese paper um, that's handmade and it's just great. It's 60 grams. It's very nice weight. Um, it's just been a super, super paper to work with for this project. I've really enjoyed um, working with it. It easily absorbs the ink and it doesn't, um, it doesn't fall into the crevices. It just sits nicely on the surface of the wood. Okay, I'm very carefully lining it up with the top, that, that top line up here. I line it up. I roll it down and I use the tube kind of as a rolling device to um, get a head start on rubbing down and getting the ink into the paper surface. Um, my next little sheet is I use a rolling pin that also gives it a little bit more, um, this way I can save a little bit of elbow grease when I'm rubbing down um, through the paper. And that's kind of my, that's how I know that I've done about the right amount is when I can really see that um, that ink coming through. So that's how I know that I've got a nice deep black ink. It's um, it's exactly what I want. So in these areas here where you want a really nice deep black, you see that um, you can see that it's not quite seep through in all the areas as evenly as I would like, but that doesn't mean necessarily that it is not evenly black on the Verso side. Um, this area concerns me because this doesn't look like it has come through. But one of those wonderful things that you can do is you can lift the print and check to see if indeed it is dark black and it is and it looks quite good so i am now going to lift the entire print and there she is All right, so thank you so much, Gabriella, for uh, getting your son to take those videos. It was, um, I do wanna say that uh, out of the 40 years that we've had an artist in residence at Bernheim, Gabriella is truly the first to have completed most of it remotely. <laughs> you know, there was a, a lot of research that went into her um, project and a lot of process that she was able to um, to do inside her home studio, which was fabulous. 
And of course, she and I stayed really connected throughout this experience. And um, yeah, she got her son to uh, do some videos, which was wonderful because I don't think people really understand when they see a work of art, all the work that truly goes into that piece. And that was just one of 10. So, so thank you so much for putting that together. Um, I do want to encourage people to go ahead and put some questions in the chat room. Um, I can kind of get started a little bit. Um, so first of all, you know, I know how you had done a lot of research on these women, but speak to your process of connecting these women to specific native Kentucky plants. Right. So yep. After I actually had read about the women's achievements and how their personalities kind of came into all of this, I do have a lot of knowledge of, of nature and a lot of knowledge of woodland plants. And so there were naturally some uh, plants that just kind of spoke to me for some of these women. I also got a list of trees from the Bernheim folks and trees that are at the Bernheim uh, property. And I thought it would be so great to join that as well. So for example, for Willa Brown, who was our aviatrix, I found that the shooting star was the perfect symbol for her since it's got this dynamic shape. It looks like it's going out into the atmosphere, as did Willa. And in that way, I was trying to um, join personality, achievements, and the woman. Excellent, you did a great job. I feel like you, it's a, it's a real educational experience um, aside from just an aesthetically beautiful and pleasing um, experience to have in viewing the work. So job well done. Um, I'm kind of curious about your relationship that sort of developed with some of these women. Um, you know, were there any questions that you wanted to ask any of them? And I don't know if maybe you wanna highlight a few that you found particularly uh, interesting and exciting. Absolutely. The more I worked with these women, the more I felt like I wanted to have long dinners with them over copious amounts of wine. So that I could really ask them about how did they get this incredible momentum in their life to achieve these goals that were just superseded anything else that was going on around them? For example, Florence Brandeis. Florence Brandeis graduated with a degree in medicine in something like, um, I think it was um, 1897. This was one of the first women's colleges for medicine. It was in Philadelphia. And I just would have loved to sit down with Florence and ask her about the practice, about what Louisville was like as a woman being a gynecologist and being an obstetrician. And then Florence did something really interesting with her career in addition to the medical practice. She was also very involved in nutrition in the schools and sanitation in the schools. And she was encouraging the schools to have clean toilets and have clean water available for the students. So these are the kinds of things that, it's fascinating, Why, what, what inspired her to do this? Um, Susie Post. Susie Post housed um, men that were trying to get out of the Vietnam War. She started kind of like an underground railroad to get them out into Canada. How cool is that? How brave is that? It was an absolutely, remarkable thing to do. I would have loved to have known Susie Post. Um, and so these are the women that to me are so inspirational that are, um, for example, um, Dr. Grace James, she not only was the first African-American gynecologist obstetrician in Louisville um, and on the, first on the staff of the University of uh, Louisville Hospital, but Dr. James, helped women from her own pocket. She helped people find clothing for their children. She taught them about sanitation, about, about nutrition. Um, 
she helped uh, create all kinds of um, organizations to prevent preteen and teenage pregnancies. This is the kind of forward thinking that we're still talking about today. And she was doing it in the 40s and the 50s. So these are the women I would love to have met and really sit down for long conversations with. All right, it looks like we have some questions from the chat. Um, how many women did you consider for this project? I think overall, I looked at about 30 different women. Um, in fact, there were a few women that the more I did the research on, the less I liked. And some women that the more I did the research on, I became enamored. So yeah, there were quite a few. And um, how long does it actually take to make one print? Well, that's a really good question because if you're taking into consideration from the research part, all through the last second of the last stroke with the wooden spoon, I think it's about, I don't know, 10, 15 hours of work per print. You know, um, it's a lot of work. I think that was pretty evident. And then where are the, on the grounds are the banners and the woodcuts? So the banners were created from the printed wood block prints from the woodcuts. And the banners are surrounding the Lake Nevin loop. And there's actually a map. They, you can start at the garden pavilion and there's a map there. And there's a map I think you can get at the entrance to the forest as well. And now you still have the wood cuts, is that the wood blocks, correct? I do, I do. I actually have them right here. <laughs> so that leads kind of naturally to the next question. Do you reuse the wood blocks to make more prints? No, I don't. I, I make one edition of prints from each set of wood blocks and that's it. Um, this particular series, I editioned a series of five for each woman. And that's it. I don't believe that I'm one of those people that believe that in many ways, it's better to keep it small because it's more exclusive. But also, I never believe that people that more than five people will be interested in buying my woodblock prints. <laughs> I do want to jump in here and just say that uh, we are selling Gabriella's series, the phenomenal series. And um, We'll be posting information on our website soon, but I can certainly follow up with everyone on this uh, Zoom with how to do that if interested. So. And the next question is, are any of the women that you focused on alive today? Yes, I believe that Judy Patton is still alive. Um, and uh, um, Jenny, can you help? I don't know if anyone else is actually. No, I think she's the only one. Yeah. Right. Judy Conway Patton um, is one of our Native American women in this series. And she was um, instrumental in passing quite a few laws regarding um, abused women and children. Um, and also set up an orphanage actually for abused children. Um, remarkable work that she did while her husband was a governor. She helped pull, push all these things through. Also created quite a few organizations for um, Native Americans here in the state. Um, and what material was, is used for the final banners? Jenny. Yeah, I can go ahead and answer that question. <laughs> this was something definitely that Gabriella and I were having phone conversations with. Um, we would have done this in person, but unfortunately COVID prevented us from doing that. Um, I did a lot of research. Um, I think, you know, when you install anything into the natural environment, uh, your materials are a major consideration. Uh, this was a, a big endeavor, a really special exhibit, and we wanted to make sure that the work would um, last. And um, it's been kind of a, 
an incredibly windy fall since we installed it. And um, it's been a, a real lesson in the natural world too. Um, we had, um, the, the banners were printed at a place called Unique Imaging Concepts, and they print on anything other than paper. And because of the particular printing process, I had to use specifically 100% polyester. But um, I researched like a, a really nice ripstop fabric that was suitable for outdoor applications, tents, flags, et cetera. So yeah, that, that's what it's made of. We even, we inserted a little bit of a, a light blocking fabric in between the front and the back and they truly look amazing. So I do wanna thank some volunteers who um, fabricated those for us, uh, Linda Crouch and Sandy Neffringer. So. Um, and what sorts of source materials were you able to access in learning about these women, books, articles, letters, or journals, et cetera? That's a great question. I actually went crazy with some of these people um, looking up their addresses. Where did they live in Louisville? Um, I found obituaries that I accessed, some which were actually inaccurate. Um, I found um, with uh, Dr. Brandeis, I looked her up in, in, in Philadelphia in her alma mater. That was the only photo we could find of her. Um, a lot of stuff online and um, you can find a lot of great material about these women. Um, so yeah, that's that was mainly what I was doing was online because it was COVID and I was stuck indoors all the time. There was no library to access. How have you been inspired by, by Bernheim for your future works? Okay, so here's, this is a really something I really did want to talk about. Um, as a consequence of having done the work previously, um, I came to Bernheim to enjoy the nature that Bernheim offers, and it has been absolutely marvelous. This is the second time I've been here. I had a two-week session in October. This is my second two-week session. And I'm finding this to be the most beautiful, most inspirational place. Um, there are wonderful trails deep in forests, in prairies. Um, there are these wonderful, um, it was designed by the Olmsted brothers, the parts of Bernheim, and they are gorgeous. Um, I'm trying something new here this time during this residency. I'm trying to do watercolors. And it's just the perfect place to be able to plant yourself in a spot and get involved with nature. It's been very meditational. So I'm gonna combine two things a little bit. Someone um, asked if there is a list of the 10 women um, and there is, I just posted a link in the chat. So if anybody is interested in that, feel free to click over to Bernheim's website where that list is. Um, and then we have the question, um, you have been to Bernheim previously and are there now. What is your impression of Bernheim? Why is it important for Bernheim to tell these kinds of stories? I think that um, finding inspirational women is important for everyone to tell right now. Um, we are in some strange times right now and finding inspiration, finding people with strength to overcome whatever hardships they've had and to supersede that and to add to community is absolutely where we all need to be right now. Um, these women were so involved with their community, gave back in, in, you know, in, in multitudes. And that to me is an important story for everyone to tell. What a perfect place to have it in Bernheim and in just hanging in nature it just makes it that much nicer. And how do you make sure the masks and the paper don't slip and spoil the piece? Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, the masks don't slip because the ink beneath them is holding them down. The paper is actually a different story. <laughs> um, the paper can slip 
And so you really have to be very careful and it's just years of practice. Um, of course, it still happens. I was printing something for a book that I'm working on, a handmade paper book, and it was the very last print. And of course it slipped and the entire thing had to be reprinted. There were three prints that I had to redo. So yes, it does happen. <laughs> I think that's it for the questions in the chat. Um, if anybody else has anything they'd like to say, feel free to unmute yourself and ask or type it in that chat box. I actually have another question, if that's okay. Um, I just kind of wanted you, I, I know you made a lot of connections in the regional community through this project from a distance and, and, and if you could speak to that uh, briefly. Yes, it's it's actually um, I kind of am starting to feel like Louisville's my second home. <laughs> I um, was connected with a, a wonderful young woman named Abby Glogauer um, at the Filson Historical Museum through a connection in Chicago um, through museum uh, a library association connection, a person that I knew and. Um, Abby turned out to be really instrumental in helping me do research about Florence Brandeis. And as a consequence, um, she and I started talking and it's the strangest story. I actually met Abby when she was three years old um, in Ann Arbor. <laughs> and so it's very weird how world can be so cyclical. And um, so um, Abby has connected me up with other members of the community that I am finding are remarkable. And um, I feel like there's this kind of small world feel about Louisville. People really know each other. There's a man who reached out to me named Michael Friedman, who is a member of the temple who uh, connected me up with their rabbi. And so it's just been feeling very, very homey here. And I really want to thank everybody for that. I also did want to say one more thing that today I went to visit Isaac and Amanda Bernheim at their, at their grave site um, to thank Isaac for giving me this opportunity because it has been so meaningful and such a fruitful time for me. And thank you, Jenny and everyone at Bernheim. Jenny, can you hear me? Uh, so, 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 I'm Tom Block. I'm uh, uh, Abby's told me a lot about you, and uh, Jenny has told me a lot about you. And I just wanted to say uh, how excited I am that, that especially that you chose my great grandmother. And uh, you know, she um, she never saw the forest, and she died in 1922, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and my great grandfather bought the saw the land, and he lived to 1944. So he really he commissioned the Olmstead brothers to come to come, and uh, I'm very happy that we are honoring that with when we renamed the ponds, and now we're and 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 one thing that I'm very proud of that working with Mark and the team is you never knew Amanda was up there until a year or so ago when uh, with the help of Derek Keith who's a board member and Mark and his and the great team we have at Bernheim we renovated that whole place. And if, if you had seen a picture of it a year and a half, two years ago, you knew that you, you had an idea that Isaac was there, but you had no idea that Amanda was there. And so I think uh, renovating the gravesite and then um, making your banner there, I think it's a great way to make sure everybody knows that this was not just Isaac, but my great grandmother and my great grandfather. And so thank you for giving her the recognition that I think she richly deserves. My pleasure. Thanks, Tom. Um, and then we had the question of how long this exhibit will be on display at Bernheim. So I'm gonna defer to Jenny on that, I believe. Well, that's to that's just to be determined, truthfully. Um, we this is an experiment with the natural world. So uh, the materials are in good shape. It, it has survived uh, some fairly high winds thus far. And uh, we will plan to keep the installation up as long as the work is aesthetically pleasing and um, and not a detriment to uh, the mowing season or anything like that. But I, I think they're installed in, in a, a great way. And 
I'm hoping that we'll have them through the next year, truthfully. Great. We got another process question. Um, once you decided you were going to change your medium to wood, how did you learn the process? Were you self-taught? Did you apprentice? Yeah, I had one um, kind of a one-on-one -on -one session with a, an artist that is a woodblock printmaker. And then the rest has been just trial and error. So really self-taught in many ways. And how many times have you displayed your work in this style? Oh, so I've been doing the woodblock prints for the past seven years. So um, I've had multitudes of exhibits. If you go on my website, GabriellaBoros.com, you can see uh, a list of the, all the exhibits that I've been in. And so, yeah, and in fact, I've exhibited um, both nationally and internationally. Um, I had an exhibit last year in Sweden too. So there's an appeal that people like the woodblock prints. It's kind of a neat thing. This isn't a question as much as a comment. Um, Gabrielle is my mother. And I just wanted, I just thought it was funny because I was looking at my Zoom background and I saw like, oh my God, in the background, here are my plants that my mother instilled the love of plants in me. And then right behind them are my um, like lino cut prints that I also made because she taught me how to do lino cut. So I just thought that was funny that clearly my mother's love of printmaking and of nature and plants has been passed on. So thank you so much for doing this. And I miss you. <laughs> well, that was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think we, have run through questions. So last call for questions. And if um, we have no more, we will let Jenny wrap this up. I did wanna let everybody know that this has been recorded tonight. Um, and so that we will be sending a link um, out in a few days. And Amy, I guess it'll be on our YouTube page. Eventually, you're muted. <laughs> always um <laughs> it will appear on youtube in the next in the next few weeks for sure it sometimes takes some time post editing great great so it is accessible i also did put a link to gabriella's website in the chat box as well uh she's done a lot of work she's incredibly prolific talented and um you can really spend a lot of time on her site and so i encourage you to do so um, I do encourage you to get out to Bernheim. Um, winter is an amazing time to take a hike. Um, Lake Nevin is wonderful. Uh, like Gabriella said, uh, you can start your phenomenal tour at the Garden Pavilion. And that will give, uh, again, some more information behind the project about Gabriella and um, a little map as well as, as the locations to where the flags are located. Um, again, I just want to thank everyone for coming to uh, this virtual talk this evening for the Planet for You. Uh, thank you for everything that you do for Bernheim, and um, we look forward to seeing you in the forest very soon. Thank, thank you. you so much.